Hi, this video is about learning the saxophone right from scratch. You've got the thing in the box, taking it out, setting it up to the first four notes. Now, the first section of this video is going to be about how I set a saxophone up, including how to put the reed on the mouthpiece, how the different sections go together. The second half is going to be about the first four notes and will include a backing track that should make the first four notes a little bit more interesting to practice because they can be quite dull, if I'm honest. So what I'll also do is underneath this video in the description is just add a timestamp if that's what they call them, of where you can go to to jump all this waffle at the start. Just find the back and track and you're off and away. But this first bit is how I set the sax up. So your saxophone should be in three main bits. You have the main body of the instrument. You have the little bendy bit at the top, which is known as the crook. And I suppose the most important piece is this, the mouthpiece. Now, a couple of things. The first thing is I'm making this video during the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, so I can't get any reads. So if that one's looking a little bit battered, um, it's because I haven't got a new read for it. And I'm afraid to say that generally it is quite filthy. And that's more just because I don't clean it very often. So in addition to the three main parts, you may have also found in your case um, what looks like a tube of lip balm. And people have asked me when I've started uh, teaching privately why you get this little tube of lip balm. And it's for this cork. It's cork grease. You just uh, rub quite a fair bit on there and it'll just help the mouthpiece to slide on and off. Now you can see with time that um, my cork has been kind of depressed up until the point where like kind of I haven't gone past, if you know what I mean. So the, the cork has been squeezed down. So yeah, just put plenty of cork grease on there and attach your mouthpiece. Now you can see here that mine is traveling about an inch down before it hits that section there. Um, so yeah, roughly an inch should do. You might find it quite difficult, um, new saxes, depending on the make and model, the cork can be quite tough when you first open the sax. Now the second thing to do, which is really quite tough, is to put the reed onto the mouthpiece. I must apologize for the state of this mouthpiece, by the way, but there's a flattened plate on the front of the mouthpiece, which is near enough identical to the shape of the reed itself. So you slide this reed down and you can see that I have my, this is my right hand, my right hand holding either side of the reed and the thumb of my left hand I use to manipulate this up and down. All right, now these, here, these are here just to keep it in line with the mouthpiece. Now I'm making sure that the full reed, so it's not like this, the full reed is straight. Then position these two fingers and use my left hand to move it up and down. What I aim for is for the tiniest little amount of this mouthpiece to be visible above the reed. Now other people might vary in that, but that is what I aim for. So you can see there, if I push it a little tiny bit more, it's covered the end there. So I'll just pull it back a little tiny bit and just the tiniest little fraction. And then what I do is I push down with this left thumb as hard as I can so that that can't move. Then we take the ligature, slide it over. And what you might find is this will happen. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm watching my phone while I'm trying to do this. It's uh, <laughs> I'm not very good at it, as you can see. But it might knock the reed out of position. So just do it again, put it on. You may find that you want to put the ligature on before you start this process, but it's not something I do for some reason. I may do that from here on in. There we go. Hold the leg and give this a spin. Now, people will ask um, the variance on kind of how tight you want this to be. And again, I'm preparing myself for taking a beating in the comments section, but I go for as tight as I can and then give it a tiny little kind of screw back, just ever so slightly. So it's not being strangled, but it is kind of, it's really tight on there. Now, the reason I'm staying zoomed in at this point is because when I attach the crook to the main body of the saxophone, you might see that on my sax, underneath this key here, there is this metallic um, bar that helps to keep this um, octave key in place. What I do is I line up this here, this kind of, uh, well, the, the mechanism of the octave key, I line it up with this piece underneath. However, your saxophone might not have that. So what I would say is that this lines up with the center of this full key. So you see this um, mechanism that you have? Now this model has the octave key underneath the crook. Most you will find will be on top. And I would imagine for the vast majority of people watching, your octave key, the full thing is on this side, but that's still okay. 
because this piece will still be in place. It's just that yours may wrap around the front and then go up. So just make sure that this little mechanism is right in the center. Then you're all lined up and you can tighten, tighten this screw. Now, some saxophones may have a screw on the opposite side, on this one here. And that is for a music stand if you find yourself in a marching band. On my sax, that is there. That's the little fella there. And you notice that it has like a square hole in the top where the music stand sticks in. Tank your screw and away it goes. For the vast majority of people, you will never have a use for this. So your tightening screw is the one on the right hand side. Presumably most sax makers think that most people are right handed to tighten this screw up. Now on the back of your saxophone, down this area here, you'll have a hook that will come out. That's for your thumb of your right hand. And the idea is that you put your thumb underneath that hook and that will keep the saxophone in position. Now you can see that this is very important. This right hand is not responsible for any of the weight um, that the saxophone has around your neck. This is gonna take the weight of the instrument. What I find is that when I uh, have new private students is they put the thumb underneath this hook and almost pull up the instrument. So you'll find that they have their hand like this. So they'll play like this because they're using this thumb to take the weight of this sax. This thumb and that hook is for, as far as I'm concerned, keeping the saxophone in line and in position. So once you've got it on your body or on, on your sling, I should say, once it's attached to you, now this thumb is gonna keep it from going left, right and swinging around. And I use it just to push it away from my body. I use it to push it away so it's not sat flat against me. So it's like this. I just use it to push it away, but I'm not lifting up in any way. Now the way that I can kind of prove that that's the case is, I don't have one on my saxophone, I took it off. I took that off because I've got quite big mitts and it was easier for me in the way that um, the layer of the sax is to actually take that off. And I just kind of, it's doing so little that it actually just sits in the position of where the hook would be. <laughs> Sorry, the kids are going crackers outside. The next thing is setting this sling so that the mouthpiece is in the right position for you to start playing the instrument. Now what you want to do is stand nice and straight, kind of, Straight neck, yeah, sort of military, ready to attention type thing. Stand straight and hold the saxophone out with this thumb at the right hand. Um, left hand at the moment, we're not too worried about. Um, you can, you, to be totally truthful, while you set the height, you can just grab it or grab the bell or whatever you want to do. And take the saxophone and the mouthpiece back. Now, as you can see, this is too long. That'd be hitting my beard. Yeah, that would be too low for me. So I can take it up. Now this is now too high. And what I'm aiming for is that if I open my mouth, this reed and the mouthpiece will sit nicely on my lip. Now that's pulling my lip down. That's slightly too low. That's pretty much bang on. But I've got to say that if you've seen any of my videos before, I've got a slightly strange way of playing the sax, a little bit like Maceo Parker, where it looks like I'm down over and the sax is like that, right? A very kind of up over point. But all I would say is don't copy me in that because it's not right. So, as I pull it back, it's just there in position and ready to play. Right, this is the last thing. And I know this feels like a lot of steps and quite long-winded, but obviously the more you do this, the more you'll get used to it. And it'll just be a quick bang, bang, bang together in, off you go. But the next bit is the embouchure. Come on, it's not coming off. So recently, because of this COVID-19 uh, situation, I've got a lot of time on my hands and I've started to teach the kids. The reason I'm pointing there is because they're out there making a racket, you might be able to hear them. Um, and what I found with my kids is when I started to teach them how to blow the instrument was because of the fact that I suppose I've taught a lot of beginners over the years, um, I try to show my boys like kind of the proper way to set your embouchure up. The problem is that one of my lads has only just turned five and to get him to concentrate on anything, for any of you that have kids you'll know this to be true, to get him to concentrate on anything is quite difficult. And what I realised was that actually he just put the sax in his mouth and blew until he got a nod to come out of the sax. Um, then we worked backwards from there um, and 
What I mean by that is he generated the sound and got a sound out of the sax and was happy with that and then was happy for me to tell him a few of the little bits and pieces of how to fix it. The reason I'm telling this story is what I would suggest is if you want to just kind of go for it and give it a bit of a goose honk <laughs> just to get a sound to come out of it you may find that in the early stages your embouchure isn't set properly but again that'll come with time. Now this is something I've just kind of come across recently because of the lads what they do, this is the boys first and foremost, is they put the sacks in the mouth and blow it like they're blowing a candle out. The cheeks puff out, the lips aren't set in any sort of way. And you get that really fat kind of honk of a sound that comes out. What you want to do with time is your embouchure almost needs to be um, like a circle that wraps around the mouthpiece and holds it in place. Your bottom lip, I, I use a technique called, well, lip in technique. It's probably got a better name than that. You get people who play with the lip out, people who play with it in. I was taught classical clarinet when I was a kid, so I was taught the classical way of having your lip in. Now, I showed this to the lads, and both of them instantly just went and stuck the lip back as far as they could. All you need to do is curve it back slightly, just so it's covering the teeth. The reason for it is if you don't cover your teeth and the teeth make contact with the reed, <laughs> So you need to curl this bottom lip back ever so slightly. Your teeth, they sit on the mouthpiece. This isn't a double reeded instrument like a bassoon or an oboe. So you don't have both lips in, just the bottom lip. The teeth will sit quite happily on the top of the mouthpiece. You don't want to bite. The way that I put this to the kids is if you had your hands and someone held on the outside of your hands, then said, right, clap. You can't, you can't open your hands up to do it. That's the same with the mouthpiece. If you grip too tight, it can't vibrate because you've got it gripped. You've got it gripped, so there's no way that it can vibrate or shift. Now, the other muscles that are important in the embouchure are these side muscles here, your kind of smiling muscles on the side. Now, like you, you are supposed to purse your lips a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> strange flute face. But once you've got this lip curled, these come together to create this circular shape around the mouthpiece. <laughs> But what you will find is with time is that your tone and your approach will change. You'll have little variants and the way that you generate a sound will change. It'll fluctuate. So I would say in the early stages, I've never said this before until the last couple of weeks, but I would take my lad's advice and just go for it for now um, and adjust your embouchure as you go. But the main thing is you want the sax to make a sound a great exercise to try when you first get a saxophone in order to learn how your embouchure feels is to, for one, play with your eyes closed so you're really concentrating on how your mouth feels, blow through the instrument and then try and perform a what musicians call a diminuendo, meaning that the sound gets smaller and smaller, softer and softer until it fades away. And you'll find that your embouchure, particularly if you've got your eyes closed, you'll be very aware that um, of, the, of the muscles working to try and keep that note under control. You'll find in the early stages that the note will just stop. It'll just give up on you. You may also find that the note will bend, which means that it'll drop in pitch. And it does that sound where it's trying to cling on for dear life. You may find that it squeaks. It might make no sound whatsoever, and that's because you're definitely biting too hard. You just can't get anything to come through. And with time, the more you practice this long diminuendo, the more that you'll kind of get an appreciation for what your embouchure is doing. So these are a few of the little things that I've found that people, uh, the mistakes that they've made. The first one is that they've um, bought reeds that are too um, thick, they're too hard to play with when you're starting out. You'll find that in your case, when you bought your saxophone, that you will have a one and a half size reed. One and a half is fine um, for the first year, probably, if not a little bit more. And a one and a half reed is just thinner, which means it will vibrate more easily. This next one is the absolute cardinal sin, number one mistake that all sax players make when they're starting out. Everybody does it. The saxophone is what I refer to as an invisible instrument. And the reason I say that is a lot of the students at the college where I work play an instrument where you can look at your hands. You can look and see what your fingers are doing. On the saxophone, the minute you bring it up to your face, 
you can't see anything. If you try and look down, all you can see is the back of it or the top of the mouthpiece. Plus your eyes go crossed. What happens there is when you're learning is you want to check if your fingers are in the right place. First thing everybody does is this, bang. They smack the reed off the shoulder when they're trying to look at the instrument. So they go bang, that's it done. That reed is ruined. Now the saxophone essentially is the reed. If that reed's no good or you've cracked it or dented it or whatever, this won't play. Think of it as a big gold amplifier and that bit there is the saxophone. Take great care of it. Instead of doing this, what I always say to my students is, as you hold the saxophone, twist it to the left and then you can see your fingers that way. You can see that the reed is out of harm's way that, that way on. So you're just playing, give it a twist and check where your fingers are and back up. This is another big mistake that a lot of people, when they first get a sax made, made, first get a sax. <laughs> so yeah, this is a mistake that a lot of sax players make when they first get a sax. And that is trying to take the weight of the instrument with the hands. Remember, this will do all the work. It's the reason it's around your neck, all right? That will do all of the weight taking thing, whatever the words are that I'm trying to say. You don't need to make your hands do it. And what you'll find is, the same as what I said about this right hand bending up, a lot of people will do that with the left hand, the pull on it. So if I hold the sax with just my left hand, like I've got to, this wrist bends because it weighs so much. Either that, or you grab it too hard and you're looking at bending the keys then. So make sure that your wrists aren't twisted like this, that you're trying to take the weight. Let the sling do it and let your wrists relax. The final thing is when you play these notes, the saxophone is set up in such a way that when you press a key, you can only press that one key. The combinations, whether it's six fingers or one finger, the sax requires that you press that one key alone. Now I have a friend on gigs called Anne, who possibly is watching this, who will stand by my right hand side and refers to this as the kill switch. He'll press that on occasion because as I'm playing, it just kills the sax, kills the noise off. It's gone, it'll kill it off. And it's the same with, even if you just know your left hand notes, these keys here, these palm keys. Now they're responsible for some really high notes when you get going, but at the start, when you put your hand on here to play these first few notes, you can catch these side palm keys and they'll have a similar effect. They'll kill the note off. So what you want to do is have your fingers, excuse me, almost like you're grasping an apple. So your fingers are curved so that they'll go around the palm keys. If you're fortunate enough like me to have, as I say, quite big hands, then your fingers can be quite straight but yeah, if you've got smaller hands, or if you're a child, you may want to have this kind of claw thing, as if you've got an apple in your hand, to reach around the palm keys. The only other thing to say, and then we'll move on with the next bit, is that the saxophone is a very rewarding instrument. It's, it's great to play. People are impressed that you've got one. Um, I know that sounds like a ridiculous thing to say, but sometimes I'll turn up to gigs where the drummer's set up, bass player, keys, guitar, whatever. Then I'll turn up and it's like, oh, they've got a sax player. People are just impressed that you have one. So you're already off on a good kind of stance. The thing is with it is that the hardest part is the start. A keyboard, a guitar, a drum, for example, you just press a key and you're off and away. The guitar, you pluck a string and you're away, it'll make a sound for you. Whereas the saxophone, you've got to learn how to create a sound and that's the hard bit. So a lot of people will give up in those early stages because it's generating the sound that is frustrating because ultimately, if you want to learn an instrument, if it's not making a sound, it's like, right, I give up. But stay with it because once you learn how to make a sound, it does then have its benefits. For example, it can only play one note at a time. You don't need to worry about chords and things for a long time. You can just concentrate on being the melody person. Right, so that's quite a long introduction to the saxophone, but this next little section is a back and track that will help you with the first four notes. I will also remember put a timestamp below so you can jump all this the next time you come to this video if indeed you do come to this video. So, your first four notes on the saxophone are on, well on this saxophone, on the majority of saxophone, have this pearl finish on the key. You've got one, 
two, three, four. But this small one here, we can ignore. So you've got one, jump this little one in the middle, two, three. On some saxophones, this won't have the finish on it, but it depends on the model of your sax. You go one, two, three. And for the first four notes, this little finger isn't gonna do anything. One, two, three. If you're learning the saxophone after learning the clarinet, there is no hole on the back like you do have on a clarinet for your thumb. So this is just a circular plate. You rest your thumb on that plate. Mine's gold, I think on others it'll be possibly black or silver. But anyway, you've got one, two, three. And these first three notes are easy to remember because they spell bag. B, A, G, bag. The other note is the middle finger by itself, C. C, B, A, G. C and B are notes that require one finger. C is a middle finger, B is your first finger. A and G are combination notes. It means that they need two. B and your A finger to go down for an A and all three for a G. What people do when they start is they do this. They bounce their way down the fingers. But remember that bag is bag combination A combination G and B is by itself and C is by itself. Right, here's a backing track that should help you with these notes. <laughs> 